Hey, it's a Sunday drive home. Look, the clean car edition and the dad edition. <laughs> Advent, chapter three. Now, John the Baptist, Advent, right? That's the coming of Jesus, the getting ready for Christmas. And remember the old, if you guys are not, if you go to a church where they don't have the church here, you, you know, some churches just have like Christmas and Easter, but um, uh, some of the more traditional churches, like uh, ours, look, here it is, by the way, driving home, dad's in the way, Hope Lutheran Church right there. Uh, you know, we have the whole church here, which is great. The, the way to think about the church here is, um, it's like this. Imagine you have uh, two stones and you drop those stones in a uh, pond and they ripple in two directions. So you got a timeline and you drop two stones. You drop Christmas and it ripples out and you drop the death and resurrection of Jesus and it ripples out. And so the Christmas rippling before is Advent and after Christmas and Epiphany and then the death and resurrection of Jesus you have leading up to it. That's Lent and Holy Week and then afterwards Easter and Pentecost and everything else like this. So so the church here revolves around these two pillars of Advent or of Christmas and of Easter. And so Advent is getting is ramping up for Christmas and especially then we have the idea of John the Baptist who is the preacher of the coming of Jesus. He's the one to prepare the way. So so John the Baptist is the major figure figure of Advent. Which is great because he has this austerity, and he's 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 stunning. You know, the Bible tells us about John the Baptist. Probably more, we probably know more about John the Baptist than we know about any other uh, character in the New Testament. We know how he was, we know how he was born. We know how he we hardly ever know about how anybody's born and dies at the same time. Now, John the Baptist is then one of these rare. Guys, we know his nativity, his parents. We know the circumstances of his the, of his miraculous conception, of his birth. And then he's there in the wilderness and he's preaching and he's just this thundery preacher. Repent. Who, he, and then, <laughs> so and John preaches like this, repent. And then he says, who told you to repent? <laughs> like, he's like Jonah. He tells the Jonah tells the Ninevites to repent, and he does, he's not even sure he wants them to. <laughs> and then they do repent, and he gets all mad about it. That's kind of how John the Baptist, he's just fiery. He's got conviction. And it doesn't matter. The soldiers come to him, which normally, I mean, if you're Jewish, you would be intimidated by the soldiers. But the soldiers come to John, not a big deal. The Pharisees come, not a big deal. Herod comes, not a big deal. In fact, he gets thrown in prison because he preaches against Herod and he says he shouldn't have married Herodias, his brother's Philip's wife, who he seduced away from Philip to marry. That preaching came back to bite him, we'll hear about later. But here's John in the wilderness and he's preaching and he's, he's prophesied probably just second to Jesus, John, is the most prophesied of the Old Testament. Isaiah 40, Behold, I send my messenger before you, a voice crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Malachi 3, I send my messenger into my temple. Malachi 4, Elijah will return and, and restore the children to the fathers and so forth. So John is prophesied all through the Old Testament. And here he comes. Now, the amazing thing about today in the church here, for us anyways, who are on the old readings, is that here comes John the Baptist, the great figure of Advent. And the text that we get to hear first is not his birth, not him leaping in the womb as Mary visits Elizabeth, and John the Baptist and Mary are in their mother's wombs and John leaps at the word, at the greeting of Mary. We don't get to hear about that. We don't get to hear about John in the wilderness preaching repentance, which is what he was known for, how all of Jerusalem was going to come out and hear that. We don't get to hear about 
Um, John baptizing Jesus, it had to be one of the most glorious moments of his own ministry. We don't get to hear about that. We don't get to hear about We don't get to hear, hear about John's great sermon, this most fantastic of all sermons. We almost hear it next week. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That famous preaching of John in the Gospels of John, 129 and so forth. We don't even get to hear about John's glorious, in the sense of martyrdom, his glorious death when he's beheaded. No, no. The first text that we get to hear, of all the texts about John, the first one that we get to hear about is this Matthew 11 where John is in prison and he's sitting there in the dungeon over in Machiris on the, in the pal palace of Herod, the wicked, that fool, is sitting there in the dungeon of Herod wondering if he was right. Wondering if his preaching was accurate. It's just, remember this dark night of the soul. We talk about how the devil comes and just presses in and wants us to doubt the truth of God's word. And now John has to doubt. His own preaching. He sent his disciples to Jesus. Are you the one? Or are we waiting for another one? Philip Melanchthon, you remember Philip Melanchthon, the old Lutheran theologian, he says that for the true Christian, doubt is worse than death. So John was really feeling it. He heard that Jesus was eating with tax collectors and sinners. Now, John was, he would accept tax collectors and sinners, but he was calling them to repentance. He was blasting away at them, and now Jesus is feasting with them. John taught his disciples to pray. Jesus hadn't even taught his disciples to pray. John was all about fasting. He was taught his disciples this life of rigor, and Jesus was, they called him a wine bibber. He was feasting. Could this, could this really be the Messiah? And I think we, you have to listen to the sermon from today. That's always on the Hope website, hope aurora.org, or podcasts around there somewhere. We're listening to about seven different verses from the Old Testament where, where the prophets promised that the Messiah would set people free from prison. Even, remember when Jesus preaches his first sermon at the synagogue in Luke chapter 4, he picks up the Isaiah text from Isaiah 49 and he says, he will proclaim the year of liberty to the captives. And you've got to be thinking that John is there saying, well, what about, what about some of that proclaiming the liberty to the captive now? That'd be nice. But Jesus seems uninterested. In fact, if you track it down, it seems like John gets arrested and taken over to the east side of the Dead Sea, and Jesus goes the other direction, up to Tyre and Sidon, away from that, so that Jesus is, in a way, avoiding John the Baptist and any sort of revolt that would have happened around his arrest and stuff like that. So here John feels abandoned, and it just is the way the Lord works, is that half the time it seems like he's working against his own promises. He says, okay, here's what's going to happen. And the exact opposite happens. And now we got to trust that what he said would be true. Like, just like for an example, here's, here's Abraham. And he says, the Lord says, uh, no, your own son will be your inheritance. And it, through your own son, through your son and Sarah's son, all the nations of the world. So finally, Abraham and Sarah have a son, Isaac, and the, Lord, the, the child of the promise Abraham's only beloved son and and then God says to Abraham you got to go and sacrifice him that's some wild stuff it's it God looks like he's working against his own promises well so here with John the Baptist here the kingdom is coming and now it looks like the kingdom's not coming at all there's nothing like a kingdom coming 
Now, you know what I think I'm going to do is post up a, a quote from Alfred Edersheim. If you guys don't have a copy of The Life and Times of Jesus the Messiah by Edersheim, you got to go pick one of those things up. You can get it online for free, but it, it's a book that you should have in your library. It's from 1901, or I think the first volume was 1899. It's in the public domain. It's really beautiful. It's really great. And Edersheim talks about this, and he says, Now this contest, this dark night of the soul, this assault in the midst of trouble, comes to every single one of us. Again, I'll put a link to this in the... Uh, in the description below and he says now the, the, but here comes the critical moment because what are you going to do what are you going to do in, when those doubts come and assaults you are those doubts going to drive you away from Jesus or towards Jesus and Edersheim made the point that John had already overcome the temptation when he sent his disciples to Jesus because that's already the victory. Because if, if he believes that Jesus is just some fake sham Messiah, he's not going to send the disciples to him, but he sends the disciples to them and says, are you the one? He wants to hear from Jesus so that his despair pushes him towards Jesus and not away. It's amazing. It is amazing. So they go and then they report back. And John gets a sermon from Jesus that will sustain him now through the rest of his imprisonment and through the rest of his life. Go back and tell John what you saw and what you heard, that the, that the blind see, the deaf hear, the lame are healed, the poor have the gospel preached to them, the dead are raised, Blessed is the one that's not scandalized by me. That's the Greek word there is this, that scandalizo. It's like the, the piece of pavement that sticks up on the sidewalk that you trip over. Jesus says, you're blessed if you don't trip up over me. If you know that I am, in fact, the one. And that, that sermon carries, carries John through. And then Jesus, it's great, Jesus turns to the people who, after John's disciples left, and he says, and he says, what do you think about John? What would you go to, go to see? A man dressed in dainty, soft, effeminate clothing? <laughs> and then Jesus says, you gotta get, the, you gotta get the, uh, the implication here. He says, men dressed in soft clothing lives in the king's house, not in the king's dungeon. <laughs> Herod was known for all this kind of sketchy immorality. So he had kind of this who knows what was going on. It's really Roman kind of thing. You want to see someone, you want to see a man dressed in soft ladies' clothes? That's in the king's house, not in the king's dungeon. No, the one in the king's dungeon is the greatest of all who have ever been born. He's the greatest of the prophets. But then Jesus goes on to say, and this is a bit of a riddle, Jesus says, but I tell you that the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Now, why, what in the world does that mean? What, what, how do we unriddle that? Probably this way. John, for whatever reason, is the only guy that we at least know of that Jesus lets die. Anytime anybody else dies, Lazarus or anybody who dies around Jesus, he raises him from the dead, but, but John, Jesus lets die because John belongs to the Old Testament. He belongs to the Old Covenant. He, he's one of the prophets in the line of Moses. And it was for them to see these things from afar. But the least in the kingdom of heaven knows everything that the prophets longed to look into. That Jesus, his name Jesus, that he was born of the Virgin Mary, that he was suffered under Pontius Pilate, that he was crucified, died, and was buried, that he's risen on the third day and ascended into heaven and that will come again that the fullness of the wisdom and counsel of God has been made known and the least in the kingdom the least in the church knows these things that the prophets desired to know <laughs> so, so why is John the least why is the least in the kingdom of heaven greater than John because the least in the kingdom of heaven knows a little bit more about Jesus than John did. How he died, how he suffered, how he rose again. Amazing. 
So we give thanks to God for John. And we remember that John is our example in despair. That when the dark night comes, when the devil just comes, when the doubts just are rolling like the waves in our own minds and our hearts and our consciences, we let them point us to Jesus. We open the Bible, we look at what Jesus says, we find his wisdom there. And when, when we do that, we know that the dawn is coming. Even before we, even before the, we see the sky lightning, we know that it's coming. That comfort is on the way, that weeping endures for the night, but joy comes in the morning. That's Sunday Drive Home.